Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone and just welcome, welcome at home to our 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Can't believe we are on lesson number 14. Usually this doesn't happen. Usually there's 13 lessons in a quarter, but this quarter there are 14 lessons. We've been studying the book of Ephesians. Today we look at Ephesians in the heart and it's really a recap of the incredible study that we have had this entire quarter. Thank you for being part of our family. Thank you for joining us. And I want to introduce you to the family on the set as well. To my left, Pastor John Lomacain. Glad you're here. Thank you, Jill. And mine is we are redeemed for community. Wonderful. In the middle, Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled, We are the Church of the Living God. Amen. Next to you, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled, The Unity of the Faith, and it's covering Ephesians 4. Amen. And last but not least, my sister in Christ, Miss Shelley Quinn. I love being here. Thursday's lesson is we are recipients and givers of Amen. God's grace. Amen. Looking forward to this study. So don't go anywhere. Make sure your Bibles and quarterlies are ready to take notes. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you have been with us through all 13 lessons. And here we are capping off this wonderful quarter in the book of Ephesians. Guide our minds and hearts, we pray. Give us wisdom and understanding, and may what is communicated be do done so clearly that someone finds you as their Lord and their Savior. Mm -hmm. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Last week, lesson number 13 was an incredible lesson. We talked about waging peace and the weapons for the conflict that the church is given in these last days and individual Christians are given. This week, as we talk about Ephesians in the heart, there's a quote from the author, um, Dr. John McVay, I want to quote from. This is from New Testament scholar Nicholas Thomas Tom Wright, and he says this. The letter to the Ephesians stands in relation to the rest of Paul's letters, rather like the London Eye. Now, I don't know, quite a few of us have been to London. You know what the London Eye is, a giant Ferris wheel, you could say, that stands 450 feet mm. above the Thames River. Wow. And there you can see Big Ben and the House of Parliament and so many historic places and cathedrals. So it says this letter, the letter of Ephesians, is much like the London Eye. It isn't the longest or the fullest of his writings, but it offers a breathtaking view of the entire landscape. What we're doing on this lesson, lesson 14, is we're taking a look back at the book we have studied, the book we have covered. We each have a different chapter to talk about. We look at the themes from Ephesians and the application we can take for our lives today. I'm going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, which is who we are in Christ, our identity in Him from creation through redemption to eternal life. And we look at the risen, ascended, and exalted Christ. Mm -hmm. Pastor John's going to be covering Ephesians too. We already studied this. The beginning part is the vertical reconciliation of our relationship to God. By grace, we've been saved through faith. Then we study the horizontal reconciliation of our relationships with other people. Ephesians chapter 3, we see the mystery plan of the church accomplished through Jesus us and how Gentiles are joined in the church and that beautiful prayer by Paul for the believers. Ephesians 4, the unity of the faith and unity of the spirit, how we treat other believers in the faith. Ephesians 5, lust versus love, darkness versus light, wisdom versus foolishness, and that love between husband and wife and the symbolism of Christ and the church. Our memory text, we look at Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, by grace, you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. On Sunday, we look at we are blessed in Christ and we're recapping Ephesians chapter one. I want to start with a poem. And this is my, probably my favorite, Who Am I poem. If you look at poems regarding who am I, this is written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer when he was in prison. 
Now, B Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the theologian, and by me reading this poem, I'm not saying we subscribe to everything that he taught, he, but he was a determined opponent to the Nazi occupation. Mm -hmm. And he was put in prison, April 1943, he was arrested for his resistance efforts, you could say, against the regime. He was executed by hanging April 9, 1945, in a concentration camp. This is just a month before the war ended there with the Nazis. He wrote this poem from a prison cell, and I think it has great bearing when we look at Ephesians chapter one. It says, who am I? They often tell me I would step from my cell's confinement, calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire from his country house. Who am I? They often tell me I used to speak to my warders freely and friendly and clearly, as though it were mine to command. Who am I? They also tell me I carried the days of misfortune equably, smilingly, proudly, like one accustomed to win. Am I then really all that which other men tell of? Or am I only what I know of myself? Restless and longing and sick like a bird in a cage, struggling for breath as if hands were compressing my throat, yearning for color, for flowers, for the voices of birds, thirsting for words of kindness, for neighborliness, trembling with anger at despotism and petty humiliation, to tossing in expectation of great events, powerlessly trembling for friends at an infinite distance, weary and empty of praying, of thinking, at making, faint and ready to say farewell to it all. Who am I, this or the other? Am I one person today and another tomorrow? Am I both at once? a hypocrite before others, and before myself a contemptibly woebegone weakling? Or is something within me still like a beaten army, fleeing in disorder from a victory already achieved? Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Mm -hmm. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. You see, in the end, Bonhoeffer, he can't answer the question. And he turns from it and he lets it go. It's not a matter of how he appears before others, nor even before himself. Both the approving court of external opinion and the sometimes harsh court of internal censure, they're set to the side. Our identity does not rest in what other people think of us. And our identity does not rest in what we think of ourselves. It rests in a source external to us. That source is God. Mm -hmm. The question of who am I anchors itself in God. Who does God say I am? And that's the answer that really matters. Who does God say I am? And who does God say I am? We find that in Ephesians chapter one. Mm -hmm. We talked in lesson number two, I think. I had the first few verses of Ephesians chapter one, and we looked at a few of the things that we are, that we say we can be in Christ. So we're gonna touch on them briefly, not take a lot of time on those aspects. And if you say, Jill, you're not taking enough time, go back to lesson two and you can watch the full thing there. But we're gonna look at 12 things from Ephesians one that you and I are in Christ. Number one, in Christ, I am blessed. We're in Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That word spiritual comes from pneuma, meaning the spirit. Takeaway number one, recognition of who we are in Christ, it comes only through the spirit. Often we listen to the lies of the enemy or the voices in our own head. You're not good enough. You'll never mm. amount to anything. Who do you think you are trying to follow God, seeking mm. to mend that relationship, struggling to find freedom from addiction? No, 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 no. We listen to what the Lord says about us. In Christ, we are blessed. Number two, in Christ, we are chosen. Ephesians 1 verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Takeaway number two. Our value does not come from what we do, but from whose we are. He chose you, right. he wanted you, he loved you from the beginning of time. In Christ, number three, we are holy. 
He chose us in him from the beginning that we should be holy, hagios, set apart, holy, without blame before him in love. Take away three. We don't strive harder to be holy as we've studied in the book of Ephesians. He makes us holy in him. Amen. It's God, the one who sanctifies us and makes us holy. Number four, in Christ, we are blameless. We should be holy. We're in Ephesians 1, 4. We should be holy and without blame before him in love. Takeaway number four, Christ is able to perfect our sinless characters and make us like Jesus. Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. Number five, in Christ, we are predestined. Verse five, Ephesians one, verse five, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. Paul saying that God made provision that El all could be saved. He wanted all to be saved from the beginning of time, from before creation. God made provision that we could be saved. We had that choice and opportunity to accept him for ourselves. Number six, we are adopted. We're still in verse five, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Takeaway six, adoption by Jesus Christ gives you and I freedom, rights, and an inheritance. Number seven, we are accepted. We're in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Takeaway number seven, Christ's substitutionary sacrifice makes us accepted in the beloved. Number eight, we're redeemed, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. That's his death, spilling of his blood to set you and I free. Amen. Number nine, we are forgiven, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. God never redeems us to sit in sin, to cower in shame, to live with addictions. He redeemed us to set us free. Number 10, we are united. Ephesians 1:10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. You see, unity comes not apart from Jesus. Unity only comes in Christ. Number 11, we receive an inheritance from God. And as Ryan talked in a previous lesson, we also become an inheritance right. to God. Ephesians 1, 14. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. As believers, you and I receive an inheritance from God. Finally, number 12, in Christ we are sealed. Mm -hmm. In him, we're in verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, guarantees our salvation. What an incredible gift it is to be in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Wow, you covered not only a summary of our days, but amazingly, you covered all that. 12 points. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Now we talk about redeemed for community. We are redeemed for community. This is a saying, no man is an island. No one lives unto himself. I've often said to people that, um, the only perfect church is an empty church. If you're in it, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible looks at us as we are, and I'm gonna point out four particular areas today that have to do with the redemption that we all experience, extrication, transformation, reconciliation, and restoration. Mm -hmm. These four qualities are vitally important when we become a part of a community. In other words, extrication from what? Transformation, how? Reconciliation with whom? And restoration from what? But Paul begins in Ephesians 2, and Jill read verses 8 and 9, but I'm going to go ahead and read uh, verses 1, and I'll find out where I want to stop. I haven't determined that because it's so lengthy. I don't want to read through all of that. I'll give you an opportunity to do that. We've done that in the past, and as Jill pointed out, this is a recap, looking back on how the community has been formed and all the individuals in the community and what makes us a community. Ephesians 2, verse 1 starts with the transformation from death to life. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked 
according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, that was the former, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. What are, he's going to bring out the inclusivity of sinners and the inclusivity of saints. He goes on to say, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others, but God. That's that transitional yes. phrase between what we were and what we were about to become. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, like Romans 5, mm -hmm. in that why we were yet sinners, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And here it is. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand yes. that we should walk in them. So as you read Ephesians 2, a question that arises, what has God done for us through his son, Christ Jesus? Now I gotta go back and revisit that phrase, but God. That is the, the catalyst. Those two words are monumental when it comes to looking at who we were and who we are becoming. I love that, who we were and who we are becoming. Yeah. Because this justification is an immediate act, sanctification is a continual act, and glorification is a permanent act. But as we're being sanctified, there's so much taking place in our lives that we have to understand and appreciate. That, that deliverance from sin, that development, and then that display. The, the, the deliverance from the penalty of sin, the development that we could be sanctified from the presence of sin, mm -hmm. kept from the presence of sin, and the glorification to put us on display before the unfallen universes. So let's ask the question, what is salvation? Let's first start with the phrase extrication. But in order to appreciate that, we must understand our condition. Let's talk about the condition. Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short, short of the glory of God. That's our condition. Whether you accept that or not, you may make a 99 foot jump, you'll fall one foot short because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all like an unclean thing, Isaiah 64, verse six. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So the Bible wants us to come to grips with our condition. A lot of people wanna join the church, but they wanna do it on their condition. You can't do that. You have to understand your condition and come to Christ on his condition. Now that's the condition, but also there's something else. Our condition, then our inabilities. What's the inability? Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leper its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil? The answer is no, that is our inability. We can't come to Christ and say, okay, now I've got it and I will go ahead and make myself righteous. There's nothing you can do in your actions that will warrant you becoming sanctified. Mm -hmm. The sanctification is a participation process. We are laborers together with Christ. We're not laboring to make ourselves righteous. He is the one that makes us righteous, but we participate in the transformation process by doing what? By simply, by simply yielding moment by moment, day by day, and deciding when I wake up in the morning, I've got to die another right. day. In order to live in Christ, in order to live victoriously in Christ, we must die another day. So we talked about condition and abilities. Now let's talk about extrication. What are we rescued from? Matthew 1, verse 21, a beautiful passage. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now that is from what they've done. That's the extrication, that's the justification. He not only does that, not only saves us from what we have done, but look what he does with it. Psalm 103 verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, 
So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Can I get an amen? amen. So if Jesus doesn't just forgive us of our sins, if all he did was that, what benefit would there be? He doesn't just forgive us of our sins, but he also transforms us. We are not just sinners by action, but we are no longer sinners by nature. Right. See, the things we've done is because of the falling short, but he wants to make sure that we don't fall short any longer. So he's not saying, well, I'm going to just wipe out what you've done and give you a clean slate to try all over again. No, we are now entering into a power. All power is given unto me. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So salvation is not a second chance to do what we can do the first time but is now the opportunity to participate in the redemptive process that is undertaken and completed by Christ Jesus himself. Amen. What is the transformation? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's the question. If you are cleansed from all unrighteousness, what are you? Hey, you, are you are righteous. Right. We have a hard time saying that. It, what troubles me so much, and I, I try to encourage my congregation not to say that, you know, we always say, well, I'm just sinners. No, wait a minute, no. In that while we were sinners, mm -hmm. so if you no longer are sinners, what are you? Saints. So I say to my congregation, we are saints under construction because <laughs> God is weeding our lives out from the world, preparing us that one day we may completely and perfectly reflect mm -hmm. his character. But what else does he do after he forgives us? Uh, as, uh, Hebrews 8, verse 12. For I will be merciful to the righteous, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Yes. Now, God has willing amnesia when it comes to my past. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that. He chooses not to forget. God doesn't have a short memory, but he chooses. This is the beautiful thing about love. You know, the Bible talks about how love, it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, continue to hold on to something you've done and say, remember that, remember that. God is perfect love, so he chooses not to hold our past against us. But then why would he? He just wiped it out. He just atoned for it. Why would he then go and take the trash that he removed from our lives, put it back on us, and remind us day by day that we are still who we used to be? That's the beauty of transformation. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, how many things? Oh. All things have become new. That's transformation. First John 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. So. We were not children of God, but we are now children of God. Beloved, now we are children of God. Mm -hmm. What kind of nation? A holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, special. He called us out of darkness into this marvelous life. Now let's go to reconciliation. Not only did he extricate us and transform us, but he reconciles us. The next day, John saw Jesus coming. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now the sins, Matthew 1, 21, is what we did. But the sin of the world is now getting rid of that broken relationship, that relationship that left us with a defective character. And Christ now begins to reconcile us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Closing up the gap. We were alienated, but through Jesus Christ, he reaches down to bring man up to divinity. Divinity reaches down to bring divinity into humanity. There's a connection, and Christ is that one that brings us to the connection with our Heavenly Father. And finally, restoration. Psalm 23, verse 3, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. And as David prayed the prayer, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. Extra, extrication, that's yeah. a hard word for me yeah. to say. Transformation, reconciliation, and restoration. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on Ephesians in the heart. We're going to pass it over to Brian Day in Tuesday's lesson. 
Amen. Thank you so much. I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled, We Are the Church of the Living God. And that cannot be expressed more clearly and more excitingly than in Ephesians chapter 3. In fact, the lesson brings out that, uh, uh, you know, what we are encouraged, it says here in the opening line, we are encouraged when we hear church members say positive things about the church. However, the most enthusiastic among us falls short of Paul's exuberant testimony in Ephesians 3. And, uh, you know, I usually don't do lists, but I didn't have to do a list because uh, Brother McVeigh actually provided a list for us right here in the lesson study and I found it to just be so such an easy way to follow and so we're going to go through this list here and, and it's I mean it's technically a list it's bullet points that's bringing out the different aspects of what Paul is highlighting about out about the experience of the church who we are in Christ and uh, I'm going to begin there in actually the first one which is he highlights the fact that right here in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 3 through 5, verse 9 and verse 11, where this is clearly communicated that we were on God's mind. The church was on God's mind in eternity's past. We were, we were in His plans before we ever were a thing. And, and uh, we read that here in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, verse 9 and verse 11, which says, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which you, or by which when you read, you, all, you may understand by knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. Verse 9, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And then verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished, Accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you know, even in times past, God knew what the plan was going to be. His whole plan was that there's this mystery that we have to understand. And the mystery is, as we're going to reveal in just a moment, uh, more clearly in the scripture, is that God is reconciling heaven and earth. In other words, us, he's, he's, he's reconciling this horizontal relationship between heaven, himself, and us, and also between us and and non-believers, or in this case, the Jews and the Gentiles, which will make that, we'll develop that a little clearly as we go through here. But our second point, he brings about how this long-term hidden plan is accomplished only through the life and death of Jesus Christ. And we read this in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11, and we're also going to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. So Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11 tells us very clearly that according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now which, what did he accomplish and how did he accomplish that? Of course it was through the cross at Calvary and of course Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 through, 12 bring, or 11 through 13 actually brings that out clearly as well. So we read that here in Ephesians 2 verses 11 through 13. It says, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands that at the time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of, pro of promise have no hope and without God in the world but now I love that you didn't have hope before you were you were kind of just drifting out there but now in Christ Jesus verse 13 in Ephesians 2 you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ that's what the blood of Jesus does the blood of Jesus breaks down all barriers it breaks down Right. all separation, the blood of Jesus. We are all of one blood. And of course, that's the blood of Jesus Christ because of his redemptive plan and his great sacrifice. Of course, Paul, uh, the lesson goes on to bring out how by revelation, uh, Paul learns the mystery of the church and the astonishing fact that Gentiles are to be full partners in it. This had to be revealed to Paul, right? In fact, this was this is communicated on multiple points uh, throughout the New Testament of how God called specifically Paul, you know, post 70 weeks prophecy, post 34 AD. He rises up Paul on the way to Damascus in which he first reveals to him, you're not, you're not only going to preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but you're going to take this message to the highways and byways, you're going to take it out there and you're going to preach this loving gospel message to the Gentiles. I can imagine that became a shock to him at first. Like, what? Gentiles? But Jesus said, absolutely. He reveals this to Peter. You know what? Everyone, all people who are, who are in Christ, all who accept Jesus Christ, Galatians chapter 3, are heirs uh, of the seed of Abraham and or, or of the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And so we see this in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, highlighting what we've already read before, but also adding 
verse 6 there. It says in verse 3, it says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the spirit of, of his holy apostles and prophets. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ, that's the, that's the key there, partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. And just to take it a step further, again, we mentioned what is this mystery? And Paul mentions it several times. It's, uh, the original word here is mysterion uh, in the original Greek. And he mentions it several times in the book of Ephesians. And the question is, what is this mystery specifically in Ephesians? Because he just said earlier, uh, uh, as I have briefly written already. Well, it's, he not only wrote about this in the book of Ephesians, he also writes about this in other parts of his writings, especially the book of Colossians. And so right here, you know, just make, making it very clear what Paul is bringing about in Ephesians is he's simply saying this mystery that was revealed to him is that God is bringing himself, his plan, his redemptive plan. Yes, he wants to reconcile the church and himself, but also our horizontal relationship between us and the outsiders, in this case, the Jews right. and the Gentiles. But you could all take, take everything I just said and put it all under one banner and it can be described clearly in what we find in Colossians chapter 1. Now, uh, Ephesians uh, most certainly would have come, probably uh, been written after Colossians. I've done some research on this and uh, Colossians probably came first and then Ephesians, but they were both written in the confinements of Paul's imprisonment uh, there as well. But it says here in Colossians chapter 1 verses 24 to 29, just again making known this mystery and, and, and really dialing in what is this mystery that he's speaking of. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Here it is, verse 26 and onward. The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. It's been revealed to Paul. Paul's sharing it. He's preaching it. He's declaring it. Verse 27, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. We just read that in Ephesians. Uh -huh. Now he's clarifying it very clearly. He says, which is Christ in you, yeah. the hope of glory. That's what all of this is about. The, the horizontal, the vertical Christ. Christ is bringing us all under the banner that he wants us to, to reflect himself. He wants the character of Christ, the mind of Christ to be reflected in his people who receive him. Of course, he goes on to say in verse 28, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Mm -hmm. That is perfect in Christ, not perfect in ourselves. To this end, I also labor striving according to the working which works in me mightily. And the lesson brings out in point number four that Paul participates in spreading this good news as preacher to the Gentiles of the unsearchable riches of Christ. We read that in Ephesians chapter three, verses eight and nine. Now that he understands this mystery, it's his job to go declare it. It's his job to help us understand it. It's also our job to help bring clarification to those who don't understand what it means for us to be in Christ. It's our job to make it clear to the world and to preach it as the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, as, as the Holy Spirit helps us develop a better understanding of this to help people understand what it means for Christ to be in us the hope of glory. That's Ephesians right. chapter 3 verse 8 and 9 it says to me who am I less than the least of all the saints this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ and of course the final point here uh, the lesson brings out that with many one to Christ the church composed as it is both of Jews and Gentiles displayed the manifold wisdom to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, announcing their coming doom. And of course, it goes on to say the plan to unite all things in Christ, according to Ephesians 1 verse 10 is underway and their time is short. And I just want to read Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 here. It says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. Yeah. What, what can we say about all 
all of this lesson and what is happening in chapter three, ultimately what we want is we want that we want Paul to pray that prayer. We want to be praying the same prayer that Paul prayed there in Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 to 21. It's an exciting thing to be a part of the church of God. It's an exciting thing to be able to know that you are a part of God's plan and that you are a part of the body of Christ. The head of that body is Jesus Christ himself Amen. and that he's not just some far distant, high and uplifted being, you know, millions and billions and gazillions of light years away, but you by the power of his spirit, his indwelling spirit can have Jesus Christ dwelling in you, his character, his mind and his love to share with the world. Amen. Yes. Amen. Powerful lesson. What a shock it must have been for the Jews and the Gentiles to realize that they have been put in Christ, predestined in Christ, uh, sitting in Christ in heavenly places by faith and to be invited into that experience. Well, I've got Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Unity of the Faith. It's in Ephesians chapter four. Paul asked believers to stop doing some things and to be sure to do other things. So what are those things? What are those things? The quarterly goes on to say Ephesians 4 begins and ends with a call to care for each other as church members, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 and 32. Between these invitations, Paul offers strong support for the idea that we should nourish unity in the church. He begins by listing seven ones. There is one body, there is one spirit, there is one hope, there is one Lord Jesus Christ, there is yes. one faith, there is one baptism, there is one God and Father, Ephesians 4, verse, verses 4 through 6. I think, John, you shared that earlier in a, in a session. And then it, it goes on to say in the quarterly, we are bound together by these spiritual realities. We are, in fact, united. Mm -hmm. And again, what a shock. The Jews always thought, yes, we're united. We're the Jews. We're the special people. But the Gentiles, they're part of this group. God's included them. Right. And, and Paul, you're telling them that? Right. <laughs> what, what, were, what merit do they have to be part of this group? Well, the merit is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's right. the merit that yeah. they have to be part of this group. While unity is a theological certainty, the quarterly goes on to say, it requires our hard work. Mm -hmm. So we should always be wow. endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit, Ephesians 4, verse 3. What do you think? Does it require hard work to be in oh. unity, even though it's a certainty? <laughs> okay. Endeavoring. One way that each of us may do so is by being an active part of the body of Christ, yeah. Ephesians wow. 4, 7 through 16. Every member is a gifted part of the body and should contribute to the health of it, Ephesians 4, 7 and 16, and all should benefit by the work of the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. These like ligaments and tendons have a unifying function, helping us to grow together into Christ, who is the head of the body, Ephesians 4, 13 and 15. So at the time that Paul told them this, that there should be no longer children, excuse me, at that time, Paul told them that, this, they should be, that they should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness and deceitful planting. The words that he's sharing here clearly suggest that the early church faced some eternal struggles, you know, some, some trickery of men, some, th some things are going awry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why Paul's saying this. And of course, nothing has changed. <laughs> we continue on with that, with that same directive to take heed to the apostles and the, and the prophets and, and to, to, to listen to the word of God and the teachings of the pastors because there's a lot of craftiness. There's a lot of deception going on. Right. In, in fact, we're told in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan has come down with great power because he, yes. he knows his time is short. So the shorter the time, guess what? the greater the power. And one of the reasons for that is because he's perfected the art of deception. Mm -hmm. He's gotten better and bet better at it because he knows us perhaps better than he knew our grandparents or our great, 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 great grandparents, right? So he's perfected this art. As Paul moves toward his final appeal, the quarterly says to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, Ephesians 4.32. He asks believers to avoid their former hard-heartedness, Ephesians 4.17 to 24. And to avoid anger, and harsh speech, substituting instead language that builds up and imparts grace, Ephesians 4, 25 to 31. This chapter on unity is easy enough to read when things are peaceful. <laughs> oh yeah, everything went so well. We had a great Sabbath school panel. Man, everyone was just clicking right along. We were just all in harmony, right? It is more challenging and more important to read when we become embroiled in some conflict, right? 
So are you remembering today the experience of the unity of the body of Christ, the unity for which Christ died? Because Christ prayed that we would be one as he is one with the Father because then the world would know. Mm -hmm. The world will know. When they have this unity, the world will know. And that's Christ's prayer in John chapter 17. Now I want us to just look at a couple of sections here in Ephesians chapter 4 as we try to wrap this up. Remember we talked about verse 1. Paul comes out of the first three chapters by which he concluded with an amen and says, I therefore, based upon these first three chapters that put us in Christ, predestining Christ, saved by Christ, it heavily places in Christ, not because of us, but because of him. He comes out of that saying, I therefore, based on this, a prisoner of the Lord, imprisoned by the love of Christ to him, I beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, mm -hmm. right? This is where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. We stand in Christ, right? And we walk in the spirit. That's and right. so Ephesians chapter four and chapter five and chapter six, but I'm just primarily dealing with chapter four here. They encourage us to take all this head knowledge, all this grace, all this faith, all, all that God is, is abundantly thrown out upon us, saturated us with. It's encouraging to take all of that and do something with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, to make it actually move our feet, to make it actually cause us to walk in a way that is worthy of it. Mm -hmm. Now, and who can walk in a way that's worthy of that? <laughs> who, we can't even come close. Daniel, probably the most blameless man that ever lived. I mean, even his enemies couldn't find fault with him in a political realm. That guy saw Jesus and he fell down as a dead man. He said, all of my goodness was turning me into corruption. There was nothing good in me when I saw Christ. And of course, Isaiah had the same experience. John had the same experience. And I think even to the very end of time, we're going to have that same experience. We're going to be overwhelmed yeah. because we've got an adversary that's accusing us before God day and night. God's not putting that junk on us, as, as you said earlier, Pastor John. Right. God's not putting that junk on us, but Satan is certainly, right. certainly trying to hound right. us, haunt us with the history, with mm -hmm. the record that God is seeking to throw into the depths of the sea. And so we see God calling us, the possible calling us to walk here, to endeavor. He goes on here to tell us how we can do that walking. And then he says in verse 14 that we, oh, excuse me, let me go a little bit further down. Verse 17, I, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, here's the word again, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And and then he, in, he makes a, a, a quick transition here. And I just want us to go down to verse 20. He makes a, quen, a quick transition here. Well, let's not go to verse 20 just yet. So we're not to walk as the Gentiles walk. So there's that emphasis again. Walk with all this beautiful grace and faith and love that God has given you. Having the understand. Don't walk as the Gentiles having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance, verse 18, that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over, over, themselves over to, to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Here it is. Here it is. Jill, you ready for this? I'm ready. Verse 20. But Christ... Yeah, I skipped a few words there. I did, I did. But Christ, <laughs> right? And notice what it says. Notice what the words in the middle say. But you have not so, what? Learned, learned Christ. Christ. You haven't just heard about Christ. This is not just some fluff that you hear from the pastor up there. You've learned Christ. Yes. You've learned about his life. You've learned about his death. You've learned about what he's done for you. And if you haven't learned Christ, you're not going to walk any differently than the Gentiles walk. You're just not going to do it because mm -hmm. there is no power in you to do that. The only power is in Christ. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God into salvation. And Paul was mm -hmm. speaking from the perspective of a very religious third, fourth generation, Seventh-day Adventist. That was his perspective. I mean, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, according to the law, he was blameless. And he says, there's no power in all of that. The power is in Jesus. That's where Amen. the power is. And then he goes on here and he says, verse 21, if so be that you have heard him and you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. There is no truth outside of Jesus. You can know doctrines, you can know yeah. theology, but if it's outside of Jesus, it just isn't truth. The truth has to be in Jesus. That's how we learn the truth. And that's how you've learned the truth, he's saying that you've put off concerning the com former conversation, the former conduct, the way that you communicated, the way that you lived, which is corrupt according to the deceitful loss. Verse 23, and you've been renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man, which is after God created in righteousness and true holiness. There's a fake holiness and there's a true holiness. Wherefore, verse five, putting away lying, speaking every man the truth is with his neighbor, for we are members one another. Be angry and sin not. 
Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you see things that you don't like, if you see things that aren't right, be angry about that. Job was angry about it and he talked to God about it. David was angry about it and he talked to God about it. And if you don't talk to God about it and if you don't process that anger at things that aren't right, this is what's going to happen. You are going to steal. You are going to... Uh, be corrupt in your communication. All of the negative things that follow these verses are going to appear in your life, even as a professed Christian, unless you process your anger. And so Paul is telling us right here, what I want you to do is I want you to be angry about those things, but I don't want you to be angry with your brother. I don't want to be angry with your sister. I want you to be angry with God. I want you to tell God how you're feeling about the injustice in this world. And I want you to tell God so that you can, he can take all of that anger out of you and replace it, displace it with the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants for us as we walk in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill, John, Ryan, James. I hope a little of that fire comes down this way. My name is <laughs> Shelley Quinn, and I have Thursday's lesson. We are recipients and givers of grace. What is grace? You may not be a Christian. You may not know what that term means. Mm -hmm. Grace is the unearned, undeserved, gifts of God. And when we think about it, the three greatest gifts of grace are Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit who lives in us and empowers us, and the Word of God. I praise God all of the time for those three great gifts. Mm -hmm. But as you recognize the gifts of grace, mm -hmm. you understand the effects of grace. You know what? Righteousness by faith, salvation by grace, nothing that you could do to merit your salvation. So here's the point. We receive God's grace mm -hmm. to reflect mm -hmm. and reveal God's grace mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. So our focus is Ephesians 5. There's no punctuation. Uh, that was in the original transcripts. So actually the author of the study, John McVeigh, suggests we begin with chapter four and verse 32, because the thoughts are connected. Mm -hmm. Listen to what Paul writes. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. We have been forgiven of so much. How could we hold unforgiveness in our hearts for others? You know, Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two, Paul says, be imitators of God as his dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us. I guess my favorite passage, uh, it's so hard to pick out, but one of my favorite passages in Ephesians is Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. And I want to read that to you now. Paul's praying for these Ephesians mm -hmm. that God would grant them according to the riches of his glory, the riches of his righteous character, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Mm -hmm. So how do we get the power to walk in the righteousness of Christ? Mm -hmm. We are strengthened with dunamis power mm -hmm. as the Holy Spirit indwells us. But it's for this purpose that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus took his humanity, it was glorified flesh, but he took that glorified flesh back to heaven. He can't be everywhere at, mm -hmm. at one time, mm -hmm. only through the Holy Spirit. Is he still omnipresent? So he says, as Christ dwells in your heart through faith, that you will be rooted and grounded in love. I see people who have been in church a long time, <laughs> they're, they're, they're bitter, they're sour, they're critical, they're judgmental. Mm. I wonder, do they not know what it means to be rooted mm. and grounded in love? Yeah. See, he says in verse 16, 
18, that as you're rooted and grounded in love, you begin to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height of God's love. Oh, mercy, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You know, the more I study and learn about the character and the love of God, and God has just increased it immensely. But the more I realize I go to him and I'm crying out, Oh, Abba, Father, help me to understand your love even more. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he says that as the love of Christ dwells in our hearts and, and this richness, he says that you will be filled with all the fullness of God. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, Peter says that God, by his divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness mm -hmm. through the knowledge of him who called you by his glory and virtue. Mm -hmm. And by his righteous glory and virtue, he says, he has given to us exceedingly great mm -hmm. and precious promises. Mm -hmm. oh, and all of those promises find their yes and amen in Christ. Mm -hmm. But what are these promises for? Listen, mm -hmm. by which have give, been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature we come to God, our spiritual DNA is the devil nature's, devil's nature acquired. But when we go and we are born again, new creations in Christ Jesus, now we have the divine nature acquired. But I believe that we've got to know these promises, yes. claim these promises, hold on to these promises because we get to the point that we feel we're not who he says we are. Yeah. We've got to change our self-talk. God's given us everything that we may live a godly life. The Holy Spirit works in us. Christ dwells in us. We have the word to be a light to our feet. He is sanctifying us and he is calling us to model our behavior toward others after his forgiveness and grace. Mm -hmm. We've received forgiveness and grace. And when we look at, uh, I, I want to read real quick because I think it's important. Ephesians 5, 3 through, I'm going to kind of sum up 3 through 5. It says, by God's sanctifying power, we can put off all fornication, all sexual sin, including, please listen to me, pornography, including pornography. Mm -hmm. Do not think that God's grace allows you to be hooked on the sin of pornography. God can deliver you from that. Mm -hmm. He said, filthy and foolish talking covetousness, which is idolatry. And he says, if we live like that, we won't have any chance to enter the kingdom of heaven. But Ephesians 5, 6 through 7, he says, hey, don't let anyone deceive you with vain words. Don't let somebody tell you that God's grace is a license to sin. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of dis disobedience. Mm -hmm. Don't be partakers at them. So now here's the point, and I've got to hurry. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 8 through 11, he says, you were once darkness. Yes. Oh boy, I walked in darkness. Mm -hmm. He says, now you're light. Walk as children of the light for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what is the acceptable will of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I know that this is a generation that has developed the attention span of a hummingbird. And people want little five-minute lessons, little ten-minute or three-minute devotionals. Stop it. 
Stop it. Put your phones down. Get into the word mm -hmm. of God, because that is the only way. He says mm -hmm. that we've got to find out what the acceptable will of the Lord is. We've got to study, mm -hmm. have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, mm -hmm. but expose them. And then he says in Ephesians 5, 15, Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, because you've got to redeem the time. The mm -hmm. days are evil. And don't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Here's the point. God is love. Romans 5, 5 says He pours His love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you receive God's love and don't let it flow from you, you're going to quench it. You're going to quench the power of the Spirit. The, the Sea of Galilee receives the living waters of the Jordan River. It teems with life. But when that same water reaches the Dead Sea, there's no outlet. It becomes dead. Mm. If you just sit, me, 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 Lord, I need me, me, and you don't share it with anyone else, you're going to quench the Holy Spirit. So I tell you, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking, and how much more the Father will give the Holy Spirit so that you are not only receivers of God's grace, but givers of God's grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Shelley, Pastor James, Ryan, Pastor John. It's been an amazing journey through the book of Ephesians. Thank you for what you've shared. Want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought. Well, the redeemed community, Ephesians 2 verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints mm -hmm. and members of the household of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. I just want to read Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21 one more time. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prison of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called. Verse 17, walk, not as the vanity of the Gentiles in Ephesians 5, verse 2, walk in love. Walk, 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 walk the talk. <laughs> I just want to say that God loves you so much. And maybe you've never opened your heart to receive that love. Just open your heart now mm. and say, Lord, I need you. I tell him that every day. I need you. I am but dust. He remembers that. But let his love flow into your heart. And mm -hmm. as you receive his love, you're going to find out it will affect the way you live. Mm -hmm. You'll be kinder to people. Mm -hmm. You'll share the good news with them and be givers of grace. Amen. Thank you all so much. It's always a blessing to study together. I learned so much from each one of you um, as we have journeyed through the book of Ephesians. And we're grateful that you're part of our 3ABN Sabbath School family yeah. and that you join us from week to week. Next week, we launch into a brand new quarter. And I think it's very fitting. After the book of Ephesians, we're equipped and empowered. We're sent forth. The lesson title next quarter, God's Mission, My Mission. It's written by the Global Mission Center Directors for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Join us next week.